suicide. Every 11 minutes, a person dies from suicide. Why does a person feel the need to commit suicide? Hello, those of you who have been struggling with suicidal thoughts or tendencies, I wanted to share some information from a behavioral psychology perspective to help you get a better understanding of why these thoughts and patterns are forming. We can analyze these thoughts and behaviors such as self-harm using operant conditioning in a couple of different ways, depending on the motives of the patient. Even though self-harm is used to demotivate a person from suicide, we can still analyze it, it similarly, and the risk factors are also similar. You could be using self-harm as a negative reinforcement to mask the pain of something much deeper going on. The cunning becomes almost a pleasure in a way to distract and alleviate the mind of what is really going on. The anger, anxiety, or sadness goes away while the person is in act because it takes their stress away. This helps one blow off their steam. You could be using self-harm as a positive reinforcement in order to feel something. This would be a response to feeling numb or detached from the surrounding environment slash society. This could also be taking it out on oneself instead of exploding and being mad with outside world. Self-harm can also be a positive reinforcement to be able to seek attention from others and feel seen. When a person feels really lonely, isolated, and abandoned, oftentimes the cutting is a positive reinforcement to the person because they know they might receive sympathy or help from someone. In all these scenarios, self-harm is a reinforcer because it is increasing the probability of the prior behavioral response to happen once again. This mostly happens because the reinforcer is leading to satisfying consequences, which makes you want to do it again, which in turn strengthens the amount a person is going to repeat the behavior. In another case, self-harm can act as a stimulus if it takes place after you engage in behavior. You thought that was bad, therefore you are punishing yourself through positive punishment. In this special case, the punisher is meant to decrease the probability of them repeating this behavior or thought by inflicting pain on themselves. Overall, the learned consequences of these behaviors are the deciding factors of the next outcomes. Another example of this is bullying and neglectful parents. Being put down by your peers, then going home to a neglectful parent can have negative effects on a child. This will cause the child to become depressed and feel unwanted. This constant bullying and neglect is negative reinforcement. The depressed, neglected teen will try to find some type of positive attention, then someone from their school attempted suicide. Positive attention floods the newly departed schoolmate. The depressed teen will see this positive attention and with other observant learning, they will become suicidal. They hope that this will give them the positive attention they always needed. Our treatment plan for this problem would be to use token economy and aversive therapy so that we can undo relationships between self-harm and outside behaviors. We need to make it less rewarding with aversive therapy for when a person does self-harm and more rewarding through a token economy, when a person doesn't harm themselves. The goal is to make sure the relationship stays inverse and consequential if the person engages the behaviors at all. First, we'll start with negative consequences by using adversive therapy. For example, when a patient walks in, they will be checked for any or reopened self-harm wounds. If they do, we will get straight into holding of planks or anything that requires physical resistance. We will also go through scenarios of how their day could have gone better or whether or not they felt like they needed to cut themselves that day. Given that patient is 100% honest, we will proceed to administer a tiny one second shock only when the person admits that they have self-harm in this situation. So the patient associates wanting to self-harm with the unpleasant shock to the body. These practices would only be given once a week and would call them wake-up calls for the mind and body. We also use self-token economy every, every single situation where the patient 
would turn in and be rewarded for not self-harming and trying to keep a streak for however long they can without self-harming themselves. For every day they go without self-harming themselves, they will receive some kind of special token that varies in value from person to person based on what they find appealing. This will reward a person and motivate them to behave in a way that is kind to themselves and not self-harming or self-loathing. Now we will talk about suicide from a biological perspective. A good state of mind that stays relatively calm is related to processing feelings, learning, and love. The brain uses neurotransmitters and hormones such as dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin in order to do so. Because dopamine deals with reward and motivation, a cheerful individual has a boost of interest in things that excite them, such as painting, hobby, or an unconditional love for a career interest. An individual should have balanced levels of neurotransmitters and hormones. Because dopamine controls thought processes, it binds to specific membrane receptors presented by neurons. Found in the hypothalamus, the axons of these neurons project to larger pathways. Before the signal is passed on, the neurotransmitter is stored in the synoptic vessel. People who have balanced levels of dopamine are able to pass this signal onto just those specific dopaminergic receptors and bind to them. Serotonin is another incredibly important neurotransmitter that acts as a hormone too, responsible for feelings of optimism and mediated satisfaction. These neurotransmitters get processed mostly in the brainstem, which then gets offered to the rest of the central nervous system. Serotonin, just like dopamine, is transmitted through the cell body and taken by a serotonin transporter from the synoptic cleft through reuptake. Having a balanced amount of serotonin would also result in a normal neuron activity level. Lastly, oxytocin is the most important hormone for happiness because it allows individuals to feel feelings of love, trust, and bonding. Emotional connections make us feel secured and are wired into our happiness levels. You could say it is almost a necessity to feel love to be happy. Oxytocin is also found in the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland through the bloodstream is found using oxytocin receptors. Secreted at the paraventricular nucleus, oxytocin is released and binds onto its specific receptors from wherever in the body the signal was sent from. On a trait level, relatively low levels of neuroticism, emotional stability are the most positive traits to have because one will always have, one will have a less reactive sympathetic nervous system and be less anxious. This is important because anxiety might put a person in distress, which causes them to panic and the body cannot feel at its best happiness when the mind is telling otherwise. In order to have the most efficient way of not being suicidal is to score some, somewhere on the scale in between middle and high of openness and agreeableness. A person has a higher chance of being happy if the individual possesses the qualities of being imaginative, independent, sympathetic, and good-natured. The solution to this would be drug therapy as the most common biological therapy for people who cannot utilize their happy chemicals on their own. Neurons are responsible for information transmission throughout the nervous system and how they communicate with one another is a key factor in how we behave. People who have problems in producing normal levels of serotonin are prescribed SR, SSNRIs or serotonin reuptake inhibitors to increase the amount of serotonin available to their neurons. Drugs like Zoloft, or Prozac selectively block the reuptake of serotonin because too much of it is taken from the glial cells. 
Glial cells communicate with one another in a separate but parallel network to their neural, neural network, influencing the brain's performance. They also influence the formation of neural connections and aid in determining which neural connections get stronger or weaker. The overall ratio of glial cells to neurons is one to one, but the glial cells take away the waste products of neurons and keep the chemical environment of neurons stable. The serotonin is stored and not all used up, so it stays trapped, trapped in the synoptic gap. Some antidepressants like bupropion work antagonistically by globally blocking receptor sites for dopamine so that dopamine cannot enter them, therapy reducing its level of activity. This leads to increased dopamine levels in the synapse, which can help recycle more dopamine back to the vesicles, where it will be stored for next time. In addition to increasing levels of serotonin, Another drug that can increase serotonin and the bonding hormone oxytocin is Paxil. Because these chemical reactions co-release, it is likely that increasing one will also increase the other. Paxil works by slowing down the absorption rate at which serotonin gets absorbed by neurons in the synapse and also increases levels of oxytocin. How our synapse work controls our behavior outwardly. Now I will talk about suicide from a critical perspective. The depression and suicide rate between the two is pretty high, but why are so many people depressed? School, separation, anxiety, and, and others are huge when it comes to depression in the Asian American culture. Being across the world, apart from the ones you love, the ones you grew up with can take a toll on someone. Expressing your feelings, having someone to escape to is a little harder. Asian American students actually have the highest rate of suicide in the community. Antidepressants seem to be very common when this task is ahead. Although drug therapy is real, drug overdose also is. Not being able to fulfill analyze, actualizing tendencies could put a toll and put a lot on someone's shoulders. One of the hardest things about seeking happiness is trying not to force it. If being happy is what you desire, allow the world to make you happy. Having that slight drop of high efficiency could do a lot. Having that high energy towards something you like doing would definitely put you in a non-suicidal state of mind. Keeping a high energy and not dwelling on the negative energy is good. Being angry and allowing your superego to build up is not healthy. Staying angry and isolating yourself is also a negative trait. It can easily also cause oppression which could sadly lose to other things. The most common treatment for people suffering depression and suicidal thoughts is antidepressants. People always go to doctors and try to get these drugs, over-the-counter drugs like Advil and Motrin. Although they have less potent than other substances, OTs over-the-counter drugs will still pose a risk for development and addiction. We only condone prescribed medications from doctors, especially since drug overdose is a major cause of suicide. Walking is a good way to get over depression and suicidal thoughts, even running or jogging. This free time will allow you to take your mind off the negative and turn it into something motivational or a motivational boost for you to finish your run. Painting is an amazing distraction. The colors will bring light no matter the situation. The 333 rule is also very helpful for any case. If you're feeling anxiety coming, take a pause. Look around. Focus on your vision and physical objects that are around you. Then name three of them you can see within your environment. Here are a few practices for you to try at home just in case you're feeling weird or just not feeling yourself. Practicing yoga or meditation is a meditation is a great time to yourself because it's quiet and only you. It's not common for people to just get up and get mad at themselves. Sleep. Sleep is also very nice no matter the situation. Using your voice is a technique to get your point across. Speaking. When you can tell someone your feelings without changing your moods would be the beginning of a healthy and unsuicidal mindset. When doing some practices like that one, token economy would be, would be used every time, simply because it shows improvement and growth. 
Every day you're able to talk, show growth, be drug free, you will be rewarded. On top of that reward, there will also be motivation that will motivate you to want to do good and give good conversations.